Good afternoon, my name is Phaedra Rehorn and I'm the supervisor here at Manatee Village Historical Park. The Historical Park is run in partnership by the Manatee County Clerk of Courts Office and the Manatee County Historical Commission, who are presenting this program today in partnership with the Florida Humanities Council. The Humanities Council has asked us to read a few words today as they do with all of their supported productions. So here goes. The program you are about to see is supported by the Florida Humanities Council with funding from the Florida Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs. FHC is the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, which funds and coordinates statewide public humanities programs and publications that explore the people, places, and ideas that shape our state. In addition to their Speakers Bureau program, FHC awards grants for humanities projects, provides seminars for Florida teachers, organizes cultural tourism events around the state, and publishes Forum, an award-winning magazine. Much of FHC's programming is supported by its membership and by private donations. For more information on the Council and how to support it, visit www.floridahumanities.org. Also, the Florida Humanities Council has available in the back these cards where you can sign up to receive information on upcoming events that they are supporting, as well as a one-year subscription to the Forum magazine. And we also have these wonderful publications back there that are presented by the Florida Department of State. And this one is on the Florida Spanish Colonial Heritage Trail. We thank you so much for coming today. I see a lot of new faces and that makes us very happy. And without further ado, I present to you Dr. Stephen Knoll and the Spanish Legacy of Florida. Um, nice to be here. It's midterms at my class at UF, so it's nice to take a break from grading and dealing with that to deal with people who actually are here because they want to be here instead of having to be here because they have to be here. So welcome. And um, today we're going to talk about uh, Spain, its relationship to Florida, our Hispanic heritage, and the relationship that that has to Florida today. Um, Florida is interesting in that many states are you know, becoming Hispanic. Florida at some level is going back to its, hit, to its Hispanic roots. So with that, we'll start here. Um, the Spanish heritage of Florida. Which of these is Florida and which of these is Spain? The one on the right is Florida. Maybe, we'll tell you later, maybe. The first thing we need to talk about is the contact between Spain and the New World, okay? And this week, we are celebrating or condemning Columbus Day, or Indigenous Peoples Day, or the discovery of America. You know, in, in, in 1892, huge celebrations for Columbus's discovery of America. 100 years later, 1992, would have been the 500th anniversary. You would have assumed that it would have been a greater celebration, but not really. Lots of questions, lots of problems, and a change of verbiage, okay? Today, we like to say Columbus did not discover America because discovering America assumes you're finding something new. Well, it wasn't new. There are millions of people who are here already. So the word that we use is contact. So Columbus's contact with the New World takes place in 1492. He takes four voyages to the New World, never reaching this landline, never reaching Florida. Okay, but that's the beginning of this Spanish connection to this place that we today call Florida. And maybe the most important kind of relationship between Spain and the New World is this thing which historians have called the Columbian Exchange, okay? And the Columbian Exchange has been around for a long time, but historians only recently have kind of named it, described it, talked about it. And the Columbian Exchange is this relationship between the New World North America, South America, the Caribbean, and the Old World. Not just Europe, but Africa as well. Okay? And it's the transfer of things back and forth across the Atlantic, okay? both on purpose and accidentally. And things go back and forth, which changes the world dramatically. It doesn't just change the New World. It doesn't just change America. It doesn't just change the Caribbean. It doesn't just change Florida. It changes the Old World, too. It changes Europe. It changes Africa. So what goes back? Well, we have three things that go back and forth. And one of them certainly is something that we are in the news today. Microbes, bacteria, germs, they travel. And certainly we know about that today because we've got Ebola on everybody's mind. Well, you know, 
We're getting upset today. You guys here still? You guys here? We're getting upset today because two people maybe have died of Ebola. And we're, we're frightened. We're now. Let's close the borders. We'll understand that the major legacy of this Colombian exchange is the transfer of diseases from the old world to the new. And not one person, not two people, but millions of people in the new world die from these diseases. Yellow fever, smallpox, measles, mumps, influenza, basically wiping out indigenous peoples in North America, including Florida, South America, the Caribbean. And they're wiped out because they have no immunities. So that's the one major disease vector that travels from the old world to the new. And we said in exchange, it means stuff goes back the other way. Well, not a very even trade. The only thing that goes back from the new world to the old world is syphilis. Okay? And <laughs> so not, not a very even trade there. Okay? But we also have animals that go back and forth. Okay? Most of them brought on purpose from Europe to the New World. And we'll talk about those and their effects on the environment here in Florida, in particular, as, as we travel along. But um, also, rats are brought unintentionally on ships. And they, no rat, no indigenous rats, you know, wood mice in Florida, but rats come with Europeans. Okay? The only animal that, come, that goes from the New World to the Old World is something that we know about for next month the turkey. Okay, so, so you know, Europeans did not have turkeys before their contact with the old world. Okay. The other thing is plants, and significant changes in plants that go from one place to another. From the old world to the new world, we bring many of the crops that will be grown for profit in the new world. Okay. We have coffee brought to the new world. We have sugar brought to the new world. We have rice brought to the new world. Okay. From the old world to the new world, we have changes in things that we eat. From the old world to the new world, wheat brought here to Florida. From the new world to the old world, we have things like tomatoes. So if you're Italian, understand before Colombian exchange, before this contact, you're mostly eating pesto. Okay, you didn't have that tomato sauce. <laughs> Potatoes. If you're Irish, the potato famine wouldn't have happened without the Colombian exchange and contact. Okay? So a massive change in both the old world and the new world, all brought about by contact, which comes mostly from Spain. Okay? So Florida is part of this Colombian exchange contact. And it starts with one of the followers of Columbus. Ponce de Leon, a conquistador, which means a Spanish nobleman who comes to the New World to seek the three G's, as we say, gold for himself and for the Spanish crown, glory for himself and also for the glory of God. That's the third G, okay? And you know, move the Catholic Church to greater places around the world. And Ponce de Leon participates in the invasion and conquest of Mexico becomes governor of Puerto Rico, but yet looks for new places. And in 1513, he sails westward from Puerto Rico, looking for new places to conquer, looking for gold. And of course, the story goes, he's looking for something else. The story goes, he's looking for the fountain of youth, OK? We're not sure that that ever happens, but it's a great story. Okay, so, so great stories are nice, so we want to keep that. So just keep that in your mind. Okay? So 1513, Ponce de Leon comes to Florida, and he names this place. Okay? In 1513, around Easter, he names it Pascua Florida, Easter Flowers. Okay? So Florida is the only state in the Union that really has a name that is Hispanic in origin, okay? unlike New York, which doesn't sound too Hispanic to me. Okay? <laughs> unlike Maine, probably not, not too Hispanic, but Florida. Know, named after Easter flowers. So he comes here and he lands somewhere on the East Coast. Okay? We're not sure okay, because his diary, his journals don't tell us where. And all along the East Coast of Florida, towns today claim to be the place where Ponce first landed. Okay? And he travels you know, from Puerto Rico up the East Coast and he's looking to see whether this peninsula is actually a peninsula or an island. So he goes all the way up the East Coast, we think, 
down the East Coast through the Straits and up to around Port Charlotte Harbor on the West Coast. And he goes back to Cuba, which is, by this point, fairly heavily settled by the Spanish. Okay? So, possible landing sites, okay, possible vicinity, all up and down the East Coast, from St. Augustine all the way down to Vero Beach, towns want to say that they have the site of Ponce de Leon's first landing. And of course, we have the reenactments, just like we have reenactments here on the West Coast, reenactments of his landing with the flag of Spain, with the seals of, of Aragon and Castile, these, um, Spanish, these Spanish royal houses. And he comes back in 1521. Okay? He does not land here. He just makes, in 1513, he just makes um, a discovery voyage. He comes back here nine years later, uh, eight years later, rather, attempting to uh, find a place where he can land to develop a colony. Doesn't work out so well. Ends up on the southwest coast, gets into battles with the Calusa, who are a warlike people. Well, of course they're warlike. Someone's trying to invade them. Of course they would be warlike. He is, he is um, mortally wounded, taken back on his ship, and he dies in, um, he dies in Cuba. Okay. And here are some statues of him uh, in Florida. Okay. This is St. Augustine. This is Miami, both of which claim to have contact with Ponce de Leon on his voyages. Okay. And in between Ponce's voyage and this voyage, which we all know about because we're all from Bradenton, or we're from, so we know about DeSoto, but in between that, the, these two voyages, the Spanish are interested in what this Florida place is. Is it a peninsula? Does it have gold? Is it opportunistic for us to settle here. So in 1528, another expedition leaves Cuba to um, investigate and discover maybe what Florida is like. They, this is the, the um, uh, Panfilo de Narvez expedition. They land somewhere between Tampa Bay and Boca Grande. Okay. Not very successful. A hurricane comes along, wipes out much of the expedition. They leave in rafts heading back for Mexico. Okay. Four people survive this journey. And again, Florida appears to be a rather inhospitable place. Well, there's no air conditioning, right? Okay. There's lots of mosquitoes, and there's lots of, lots of rather warlike Indians. So it's not a very, it's not a very pleasant place. Okay. But opportunity is there. People are always looking for possibilities to get rich, to get wealthy, to get to the glory of Spain and themselves. So in 1539, another expedition leaves Cuba, this time to discover, okay, not, not a colony. Hernando de Soto, a decorated veteran of the campaign to capture Peru, okay, he's, one of, he's one of Francisco Pizarro's chief conquistadors. He wants to find out glory for himself. 500 soldiers and Nine ships land in May of 1539, right down there, okay, right down there. And this is, this is from his journal in May of 1539. On Sunday, the 18th of May in the year 1539, the Adelacondo, or the governor, which is DeSoto, sails from Havana with a fleet of nine vessels, five of them ships, two caravels, two pinnaces, those are smaller vessels, okay? Run seven day with favorable weather. On the 25th of the month, being the festival of Espiritu Santo, which is the Holy Spirit, okay? the land was seen, and anchor cast a league from shore because of the shoals. So they're about two or three miles offshore. On Friday the 30th, the army landed in La Florida, two leagues from a town of an Indian chief called Yukita. So soon as the people were come to land, the camp was pitched on the seaside near the bay, which goes up close to the town. Presently, the captain general, which is second in command, Vasco Porcalo, taking seven horsemen with him. So they got horses. Okay, that's interesting. Went up to the country half a league about and discovered six Indians who tried to resist him with arrows, the weapons they are accustomed to use. The horsemen killed two, and the four others escaped the country being obstructed by bushes and ponds in which the horses bogged and fell with their riders of weakness from the voyage. At night, the governor with a hundred men, that's DeSoto himself, with a hundred men in the pinnaces came upon a deserted town. For so soon as the Spaniards appeared in sight of land, 
They were seen from the distance by the Indians, and all along the coast, many smokes and fires were seen to rise from the Indians to warn one another of the incursion of the Spanish. Okay? So pretty quickly, we have confrontation, conflict between Native Americans and the Spanish who are coming here. Okay? De Soto's voyage is amazing. Okay? Here he is landing with the Junior Rangers at the Soto National Mon Monument. There's the, the smaller boats. Okay. Here he is, again, at, along the shoreline right here of um, the Gulf of Mexico. His voyage is unbelievable. He starts here in what will be Manatee County, travels up I-75, okay, <laughs> okay goes west on I-10, and it's interesting because those routes follow Indian trade routes, which follow Spanish routes, okay? So it goes all the way up here, and when we think of Spanish America, we think of basically Florida. But understand that De Soto claims North America for the King of Spain all the way to North Carolina. His voyage travels up here, right near Ocala, where they just, in the past 10 years, have discovered one of his camps, which is a, a truly amazing archaeological find, and they're working on this right now. All the way up to present-day Tallahassee, then through the mountains of Georgia into western South Carolina, up into the mountains of North Carolina, into Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi. He dies on the banks of the Mississippi River. Okay. It's unbelievable I mean, how far these guys travel. He is buried surreptitiously because the assumption was Indians thought, and whether, whether this is true or not, we're not sure, but the Spanish thought the Indians thought that he was a god, and gods don't die. So they had to bury him kind of surreptitiously to make sure the Indians didn't realize that, hey, he's not a god. Okay? So this expedition, unbelievable, all through basically the whole southeast United States, okay? claiming this for the king of Spain. As he comes here, basically, he changes the environment dramatically. Not he himself, but he, his followers, and the Spanish who are with him. Okay? As we talked about the Colombian Exchange, animals are important. They bring lots of pigs with them. They bring lots of horses with them. They bring lots of cattle with them. Pigs are wonderful. They can travel along with them. They're basically food on the hoof. They travel with you, kill them, eat them. Okay? But Many of them escape, and we all know the problems of wild hogs in Florida. And we can all thank those early Spaniards for bringing them here. Yeah. This is the, where they are today, yeah. pretty much almost all of Florida. Here's where they are in the state. This is what they do to your lawn. Okay. <laughs> not, very, not very pleasant. And certainly, you know, no hoofed animals at all before European contact, before the Spanish came here. Okay? So they are not necessarily brought here to dig up our lawns, brought here for food, but without the Spanish, we wouldn't have that. Okay? So pigs. Florida agriculture, certainly much of what we grow is a relationship to what the Spanish brought here. Indians are growing corn. Indians are not hunter-gatherers. Okay? Indians out in the woods gathering stuff. No, Indians in Florida are sedentary agriculturalists, and they're growing basically one thing. What are they growing? Corn. corn. They're growing corn. Okay, they're growing corn. Okay, they're growing corn. Okay, but Florida agriculture grows other things today besides corn. Florida agriculture grows things that we sell, grows things for the market, and almost all of those items that we have are a result of Spanish contact. Oranges. Oranges. Oranges are not native to Florida. Okay? Oranges are brought by the Spanish and become the largest industry in Florida into the latter part of the 20th century. Okay? Much of central Florida changed dramatically by the introduction of groves in the middle to late 19th and into the early 20th centuries. Okay? Citrus Tower, again, as a result of Spanish influence, Spanish bringing, and Spanish changing. The original oranges are pretty sour. Am I like sour oranges? Grafting, changing, we have turned 
the orange into the Valencia orange, the sweet orange that we know today. So when we talk about GMO and freak out about genetically modified food, understand this is among the first genetically modified foods, okay? That orange that we eat doesn't exist in nature originally, okay? It's, people are messing with it, that's okay. Interesting, interesting, okay? And it becomes the symbol of Florida, particularly in the 20th century, okay? Day without orange juice, morning without orange juice, like a day without sunshine, okay? And again, we have the Spanish to thank for that. Readings from Florida, and certainly today, the Florida citrus industry is in dire straits, okay? Competition from Brazil and a series of, you know, freezes in the late, late part of the 20th century, the fact that land can be worth more developed than it can be as citrus groves, and the recent horrific introduction of citrus greening it puts Florida citrus in danger. Okay? We're not sure where it's going. But, you know, where I teach UF, IFAS, we know what IFAS is? We know what IFAS is? Institute for Food and Agricultural Sciences. IFAS is working really, really hard to try and stop citrus greening, find a way to, to stop the citrus from dying. Okay. Second thing the Spanish do is bring cattle. Okay. Spanish cattle ranching. Cattle come again with DeSoto. Like pigs, they are food on the hoof. Easily fed, they can graze on natural grasses in Florida. You don't have to do anything with them. When you're ready, you can butcher them. And Spanish Cattle ranches spread over much of central Florida. In fact, the largest cattle ranch in the state under Spanish times was named Alachua, which is the county that I live in in Gainesville. Okay? So there it is, corrupted into Alachua County. You can read that. I don't even have to talk. You can just read that. Okay? So, Spanish brands, we have the Spanish cattle, which becomes adjusted to the harsh Florida summers. And these wild cattle, the Spanish eventually are forced out, first in the 1760s by the British, then in the 1820s by the Americans. The cattle remain. Okay? Cattle ranching becomes an important part of Native American culture as Seminoles, who, who, like almost everybody else, are snowbirds, pushed down from Georgia and South Carolina and, and Alabama. Um, they end up being cattle ranchers as well, using the cattle that are left over from the Spanish and also riding on horses that are left over from Spanish as well. Okay. Civil War, Florida becomes the beef entrepot for the Confederacy. Florida supplies much of the meat for the Confederate armies, and much of that meat is from cattle that descended from Spanish herds. Anybody know who this guy is? This is Jacob Summerlin, and he's got a great name, King of the Florida Crackers. Okay. Jacob Summerlin is the chief Florida cowboy in the time period after the Civil War, and you know, he, huge cattle drives, except they're not driving them north, they're driving them south and west to Punta Rasa at the mouth of the Caloosahatchee River, okay, which is where Ponce de Leon maybe landed. Okay. And where do they ship them from Punta Rasa? They ship them to Cuba. Okay. They ship them to Cuba, because Cuba needs beef. Why does Cuba need beef? Because in the 1800s, almost every acre of available arable land in Cuba is being used for sugar production. So they're importing beef to feed first the slaves, because slavery is not abolished in Cuba to the 1870s, which is a Spanish, a Spanish territory. And then the free laborers that are there. So Florida's connection to Spanish Caribbean, particularly important with assumptions about cattle. This is a great thing. This is, this is cattle on the, on the, on the beach. How would you like to go down to Anna Maria Island and see a, a herd, of, <laughs> herd of grazing cows out there? Okay. So, thank the Spanish for that. Okay. Um, Florida Cracker Cowboys, okay. again, riding horses that were descendant of, of Spanish horses, the Florida Cracker Horse. They might know who, who painted these pictures? Frederick Remington. Frederick Remington is, is well known as, as a portrayer of life on the western frontier. In the 1890s he comes to Florida to portray life on the Florida frontier, you know, which again, horses and cattle as a direct result of contact with Spain. Okay. And here are, these are modern Florida cowboys. These pictures look very similar to what it would have looked like in Alachua County 
except maybe for the genes. But other than that, what it looked like in Alachua County in the 1700s under Spanish rule. Okay. Sugar. Sugar is brought to Florida as well, an attempt to make Florida a growing economic concern. They didn't find gold, okay? They didn't find gold. They didn't find the fountain of youth, okay? Although the springs may have been the origin of that myth, okay? So they have to find something. By they, they mean, they mean European explorers and, and, and um, settlers. They have to find something to make money, possibly, maybe, sugar. So sugar plantations developed in Florida along the East Coast. Sugar mill, if you go to De Leon Springs, you will see the old sugar mill there. This is one near DeLand. This is the um, remains of a sugar mill in, in uh, Volusia County, Bulow Plantation. Hard, difficult, laborious work, okay. often done by, done by slaves or Native Americans. And the results of that today, huge sugar plantations south of Lake Okeechobee. Sugar is still a major industry in Florida. You know, we, we have significant amounts of mechanized um, capturing of the sugar, but still large numbers of migrant workers whose work resembles these people, many of them Hispanic. So we have this coming from Central and South America. Interesting kind of juxtaposition as the wheel turns completely. The Spanish finally settle completely in Florida in 1565. Okay. In 1559, they attempt to settle in Pensacola. This man named Tristan de Luna brings a, a huge, by, the time, by, by that time period, uh, settlement group of 1,000 people, men and women, which is unusual because okay, the assumption is we're going to settle there. And they go to Pensacola. They're going to land there. Pensacola Bay is very nice. Within one month, it is decimated. What destroys it? It's September. What destroys it? <laughs> hurricane. OK. Destroyed by a hurricane. OK. Destroyed by a hurricane. Hurricanes are important. Hurricanes and, and Spanish have this interesting early relationship. So Tristan de Luna's expedition fails. Less than five years later, the French, those darn Frenchmen, they start to build a colony on the St. John's River, okay? And the Spanish can't have that happen, as you saw before. De Soto claimed all this land for Spain. So a Spanish military expedition is sent to deal with the French. Okay? Under Pedro, Pedro Menendez de Avalos, it lands near St. Augustine. Menendez attacks the French and at a place called Matanzas, destroys the French. What does Matanzas mean? Anybody know? Death. What? Death, slaughter, yeah, Death. massacre. Yeah. Okay. And the reason he's so able to do this so quickly is because the French relief fleet was destroyed by a hurricane. Okay. So now we've got Spain permanently established in La Florida. 1565, St. Augustine, Pedro Menendez de Avalos. Two things are important about this. Number one, military. This is the fort not built to the next century, but St. Augustine is a military outpost, okay? designed to be a protecting place for Spanish treasure fleets. When Spain is sending all the gold and silver that has been taken from the mines of Central and South America back across the ocean, they have to travel northward to catch the currents of the Gulf Stream to go across. And right there is St. Augustine. So St. Augustine is a military place. Okay? And so once again, Florida today, much of Florida's economy, particularly in the panhandle, based upon military stuff, that's a legacy of Spain. Okay? That's a legacy of what happened with the Spanish. We have soldiers. We have um, ancillary activities, including women of the night. Okay? All those kinds of things associated with military garrison life in St. Augustine. Okay. And the other thing, we have the missionaries. So military and missionaries. St. Augustine is a mission center designed to convert Native Americans, those Native Americans who are left, after not having been wiped out from diseases, to Catholicism. Okay. 
Franciscan missionaries come here, they're based in St. Augustine, and they travel westward and southward, but mostly westward, okay, and set up missions about a day's journey apart. Okay. These missions are designed around a central church, and Indians come there, Indians um, build, build their uh, fields of corn around there, and much of that corn then is sent to St. Augustine to feed the soldiers. Okay? So, when we see Florida here, understand, not much south of, say, where today Ocala is. Very few people live in the peninsula part. You know, from I-4 south, there's almost nobody. Okay? Certainly, not, certainly not Seminoles, because Seminoles aren't here yet. So we have significant numbers of missionaries all along here, along what's called El Camino Real, the King's Road, I-10. If you go to Tallahassee today, Mission San Luis, the Appalachian Indians, this has been uh, restored and rebuilt. Amazing place, wonderful to go to. In 1704, the English come here and burn the mission. Okay? Because certainly, as a garrison town, Florida is at the center of, of the, what's called the borderlands. England to the north, the major part of the Spanish Empire to the south. Florida is right at the middle here. So significant battles between English and Spanish, and the Indians are caught in the middle. Church, an important part, obviously, of the Spanish experience. Gold, glory, and God. The cathedral built in 1797, other churches before then, that church is still in existence. That church is still used. Okay? And St. Augustine becomes the center of Catholicism in the New World, what is today in North America. And the other interesting thing about Spain is its rather fluid understanding of race relations. The Spanish had slavery, okay? No doubt about it. The Spanish had slavery. But certainly the relationship of white to black is very different in Spanish law, in Spanish ideology, in Spanish custom than it is in English custom. And this place, Gras Real de Santa Teresa de Mose, is the first free black settlement in what will be the United States. Now, how does that happen? Well, Spain is pretty much at war with England throughout much of the early 18th century. And one way that Spain can hurt English settlement is to hurt them economically. How can they hurt them economically? Well, the English in the closest settlements to Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. What are they doing for a living? They're growing through plantation agriculture. And for plantation agriculture, what are they using as labor? Slaves. Okay, slaves. Now, if we can entice these slaves to leave Georgia and South Carolina and come to Florida, we can hurt the English economically. And also, these people can help us. Okay, they're good workers. If they become free here, they'll work harder because they're not slaves. So it helps us, it hurts the English. Okay? So this town is built just north of St. Augustine to house those runaway slaves from Georgia and South Carolina. Now what do these people have to do when they come to Florida? They have to pledge allegiance to the king, the king of Spain, and they also have to pledge allegiance to Catholicism, convert from the heathen Protestants to Catholicism. Okay? And Mose is built north of St. Augustine as the kind of outlier post because the Spanish are smart. They understand these people will fight to the death if an English incursion comes here because they do not want to be recaptured and returned to slavery. Okay? So interesting. These are some of the black militia, so they're involved, you know, they're involved in regular Spanish army activities. This is the Battle of Bloody Mose in 1739 as English forces come down from Georgia to fight against the Spanish. And the first group they come upon are those black Spaniards. And this is maybe the most interesting guy. I mean, everybody, know, everybody knows about DeSoto. Everybody knows about Ponce de Leon. They're interested. Everybody knows about Narvaez, maybe. He's interesting. This guy is more interesting than anybody. This guy may be the most interesting guy in colonial America. Okay? 
born in Africa as a, slave, uh, as a free man, captured, taken over on the Middle Passage to uh, South Carolina, where he becomes a slave, runs away from South Carolina to Florida, where he becomes a free man, learns Spanish, becomes a practicing Catholic, and becomes commander of the garrison at Fort Mose. He also then becomes a privateer. What's a privateer? Anybody know what a privateer is? It's a pirate. Yeah, no, you say privateer, I say pirate. Okay. A privateer is a pirate in the, in the um, employ of the crown. So, so he's an official pirate, whatever that means. Okay. It means he's not working at, at Pirates of the Caribbean at Disney. Okay. He's, a, he's a privateer for the crown of Spain. He's captured by the English, sold back into slavery in South Carolina. Escapes again, comes back to Florida, resumes his, resumes his leadership of the, of the garrison at Fort Mose. In the Battle of 1739, he, he is a chief leader in forcing the British out. And he writes a letter to the King of Spain, which we have. It's in the archives um, in Seville. There's a copy of it in the archives of the University of Florida. Writes a letter to the King. Hey, King, I did a good job for you. How about some land? Give me some land. I deserve it. The king does it. The king gives him land. I mean, it's an amazing story. Okay? He's still, as, as an older man in 1763, bad things happen. Geopolitical concerns take place, and Florida is captured by the English. The Treaty of Paris, Florida is now English. So what's this guy going to do? He and his garrison of runaway slaves, now free blacks, now free Catholic blacks, leave Florida with everybody else and go to Cuba. They establish a town there in Cuba. 20 years later, Florida comes back to, Sp to Spain as a result of another treaty. By this time, Menendez is dead, but his children come back to Florida. I mean, it's an amazing story. And so, you know, they're there. It's a, just an amazing story. This is the grant. It says Ariadondo Grant. Okay. This is the huge land grant given to the Ariadondo family in the center of Florida. Um, huge cattle ranch around Alachua. And you know, if you, if you go to the university, anybody go to UF? No. Okay. If you go to UF at the Rights Union, you know the Rights Union? Okay. Well, upstairs on the fourth floor, there's a restaurant, the Ariadondo Room. That's named after this grant. Okay. And you know, you look at, at my house and, and the, the plat stuff, you know, you go through the book and see you know, what this land was originally. Our house was built on, on land from the area of Dondo Grant. So you know, this kind of central Florida stuff, really interesting, really interesting. So by 1821, Spain has had Florida, lost it to the English, regained it. 1821, Florida becomes United States territory. Okay? So in 1821, Florida becomes U.S. territory. 1845, Florida becomes a United States state. And it appears that kind of the Hispanic connection is, is going away. Um, Americans are coming down from uh, Georgia, South Carolina, okay, bringing their slaves with them, fighting against other people pushed down to Florida, the Seminoles. Seminoles are originally from Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, okay, pushed down here. So, the one place that really remains Hispanic is Key West. Okay? Understand, Key West is the largest city in Florida into the middle 19th century. And it's not attached to the mainland, okay? just out there, out in the middle of nowhere. Okay? And, and Key Westers, conks, make their living by um, basically wrecking things, which, which is a euphemism for piracy. Okay? Ships, ships uh, um, lose themselves and, and get hung up on the shoals of the Florida Straits. Key West wreckers come and help them out. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so Key West, because it's so close to Cuba, has an interesting connection. And one of those connections is cigars. Okay? As Cuban cigar makers build a cigar empire on the island of Key West in the middle 1800s. Key West cigars. The El Gato Cigar factory. Gatto, which means cat, but you know, Mr. Gatto, this, this building is still around today. His cigar factory is the largest employer in Key West in the last quarter of the 19th century. Most, most of those cigars in, uh, exported to the United States, some of them sent back to Cuba. 
But things not so good. Hurricane hits Key West, again, you know, hurricanes are always involved. Hurricane hits Key West in the 1880s, and he's having trouble with his labor force. They don't want to work for the wages that he's paying them. So other Key West entrepreneurs say, let's look other places. And in 1886, Vicente Ebor comes from Key West to this godforsaken place just south of Tampa and says, boom, this is where I'm going to put my factory. Establishes Ebor City as a factory, as a, as a company town to make cigars. And Spanish and Cuban workers come with him. And it becomes the largest cigar manufacturing center in the United States into the 1940s. There's a, there is the factory, there's one of the houses, you know, built by Ebor, rented to his workers. Workers are skilled artisans, hand, handmade cigars. They're rolling them by hand into the 1930s. Okay? All of them speaking Spanish, speaking Italian, Cubans, Spaniards, people from Italy as well. An entirely, interestingly diverse culture in a state that is overwhelmingly cracker, as it were. Okay, very interesting. And building their own mutual aid societies. Okay, because they're a separate culture, the Centro, Centro Asturiano. Asturia is an area in Spain where some of these people come from. This building is still around. So what do they do there? You can get lunch there, you can get dinner there. Saturday night dances, Friday night dominoes. That's nice, but it also provides medical care and most importantly, burial care, okay? Can't afford a burial, you belong to the Centro Asturiano, you're buried in the Centro Asturiano Cemetery, which is still there. And if you're not from Asturia, you're not gonna go there, you're gonna go to your own place. There's the Cuban club, same type of thing. You know? I mean, it's amazing, huge, um, huge auditoriums, amazing places. So, you know, kind of a separate, vibrant culture established in these places. And a culture that still relates significantly to the place where they're from, and that's Cuba. Okay? 1880s, Cuba's embroiled in trying to fight for freedom against Spain, the last of the Spanish colonies, Cuba and Puerto Rico, the last of the Spanish colonies remaining as the legacy of Columbus. Anybody know who this guy is? Well, you can read. So. It's Jose Martí, okay? Jose Martí, the father of Cuban independence. Interestingly enough, he is lauded both by Castro, who thinks he's great, and by the anti-Castro Cubans in Miami, who thinks he's great. So that's interesting, okay? So Martí travels back and forth between Tampa, Key West. He's been, he has been exiled from Cuba. Tampa, Key West, and New York, trying to get American support for Cuba's independence. Here he is speaking on the porch of one of the buildings in Ybor City. 1894, Cuban Revolution starts again. As Martí goes back to Cuba, within three months he is killed in battle. But the sign for the Cuban Revolution to start, a message is smuggled back into Cuba in a package of Tampa cigars. So that's... So in 1898, Florida has changed dramatically. We have the railroads coming in. Henry Plant has built his railroad from Fernandina and Jacksonville across the state to Tampa and builds this hotel. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is the hotel, part of this new idea to build hotels that look like old Spanish things, because Florida is that Mediterranean climate. I want people to think of this Mediterranean stuff. So the hotel not doing so good. It's expensive and because it's not on the water. We've all, we, we know where the Tampa Bay Hotel is? It's on the Hillsborough River. People increasingly, by the late 19th century, early 20th century, where do they want their hotels to be? On the water, on the beach. Okay, this is not there. But this hotel has its moment in the sun in 1898 as it's the central place for planning the American part of the Spanish American, Spanish American Cuban War. Okay. So Roosevelt and, and other American generals, here they are in the veranda. Here's the hotel. What, what is the hotel now? Do we know? University, University, University of Tampa. Go there. It's great. Go, I mean, go, I don't go to school there, but go there. Visit it. 
Go there at Christmas. Their, Victor their Victorian Christmas thing is fantastic. But Tampa also becomes the major launching point for the United States' military incursion into Cuba. Not Miami, because Miami doesn't exist. Okay, Miami has like 300 people. Right? Not Key West, because Key West isn't, isn't attached to the United States until 1912. Okay? It's, it's just an island floating out there. It's Tampa. And Tampa becomes the centerpiece of our connectivity to Cuba. Cuban memory of the Spanish War in Key West, still there. This is a turret from the main. Yeah. Now, as we said, Henry, Fla uh, Henry Plant builds his railroad across the state. Same time, Henry Flagler builds his railroad down the East Coast. Henry Flagler, former associate of, who knows, John D. Rockefeller. Okay, Henry Flagler worked with John D. Rockefeller. Got bored, came to Florida. Liked the climate, thought it was good for his wife who was dying. She dies, he marries the nurse. Well, well we're not going to go there, but. <laughs> and just like Henry Plant, builds big hotels along his railroad line. Big hotels that mirror Spanish influence. The huge Ponce de Leon Hotel, at this point, the largest electrified building in the United States when it's built in the 1880s. Okay? Today it is Flagler College. Okay? These colleges just do really well having these old hotels. But you know, once again, we see it looks like the Alhambra. You know, it looks, there it is again. I mean, it looks, looks like a Spanish medieval town. Okay. 1920s, we see this amazing growth of Spanish architecture in Florida. Florida has this land boom in the 1920s. World War I's over. This incredible boom. The Miami Herald of this pretty small city is the largest newspaper in the United States for a couple of years, basically, because all it's all ads. You know, buy this. And what are we selling? Well, we're selling the Florida dream. We're selling the fact that Florida is this Mediterranean place, this Hispanic place, and in order to be Hispanic, we have to have Spanish architecture. Addison Meisner comes from California and builds Florida as this. Hispanic paradise. Anyone know what city is most associated with? Boca Raton. Okay? You go to Boca, all those Hispanic buildings, those Spanish heritage buildings, they're the legacy of Addison Meisner. Meisner, just like almost everybody else in Florida, goes belly up in the bust of the late 1920s, but his legacy is the Spanish architecture that we still associate with Florida. And 1939, you know, World's Fair in New York City, okay? we're selling Florida. What do we use as a selling point. Certainly the Florida Pavilion at the 1939 World's Fair looks Hispanic, looks Floridian, looks Spanish. Okay? That's what we're selling. New York in the 1930s, cold, dingy, coming out of the Depression. What better thing to do than look at, wow, amazing Spanish architecture. Okay? And then we have the post-World War II, boom, Florida appears to be kind of moving away from that kind of Spanish roots. Thousands of people come down from the north, emboldened by, you know, coming here during the war. We loved it. But then 1960, Castro, communism, Cuba. Florida goes back to, his, it, to its Hispanic roots. And you can see how close Key West is to Havana. Okay? And thousands of Cubans come over in waves from Cuba, fleeing Castro changing Miami, changing Florida, changing America. Flights to freedom. Okay, we see all these. Kind of, we have three different, actually four different waves. The first wave of migration, mostly upper class Cubans, um, many of them wealthy, many of them with, with skills, doctors, lawyers, um, architects. The Cuban Missile Crisis stops that, okay, in 1962. 1965 to the 1970s, we have freedom flights from Havana. Castro, no one knows why, is letting people leave. These are mostly middle class, not necessarily with those kinds of skills that the upper class people had, but hardworking individuals. Okay? In the middle of all this, we have this really interesting thing called Operation Pedro Pond, which is what we call it. You talk to Hispanics, they say, what are you talking about? It's Peter Pan. Okay, it's Peter Pan. The, 
Man, I, here I am in, in class. <laughs> this is what happens in class. <laughs> Maybe it's Castro. So Operation Pedro Pond is this amazing escape of 15,000 young people without their parents from the mid-60s into the late 60s, developed through the Catholic Church, through this woman named Polita Grau, whose father was president of, of, of Cuba before Castro and before Batista, and through the CIA. Okay? Parents send their children to America. Why? They're afraid. They want the children to have a better life. The assumption is that Castro will send their children where? Russia. Yeah. I mean, that, that never, does, doesn't happen, but fear is, a, uh, fear is a, a great thing, a scary thing. And where the, we'll get back to Pedro Pan in a minute. Where is the Ellis Island for those Cubans? It's the Miami Freedom Tower. Okay? Miami Freedom Tower, really an interesting thing. It was built in the 1920s in the midst of the, of the Florida boom by the editor and publisher of the Miami News, the other major paper, okay? built to look exactly like the Duralda Tower of the Seville Cathedral. Okay? So once again, that relationship of Florida to Spain. The newspaper goes belly up by the 1950s, the building is abandoned, and in the 1960s it becomes Ellis Island for all those Cubans. This is where they are processed. Okay? This is their first look at America. This is what it looks like inside. Again, looks like Spain. Now associated with Miami-Dade College. It's great. All these great Spanish buildings turn into colleges. It's wonderful. These are some of the flights. This is the Freedom Flights. This is Operation Pedro Pan. This is Father Monsignor Brian Walsh, leader of the Catholic Church mission to send these people to America, okay? Amazing stuff, amazing stuff. Carlos Aire, one of the people who, who comes over here, it's a great book, Waiting for Snow in Havana. It's his, it's his um, memoir of being a child coming over here and living with a family, first in Florida, then in Nebraska of all places. Anybody else know who else was part of that? Former Florida Senator Mel Martinez comes over as part of Pedro Pond. Cuban memorials in Miami making the connection between the Cuba and the island only 90 miles away. The Bay of Pigs Memorial. Bay of Pigs is a failed expedition to recapture the island in 1961 because Cubans assume that the president at that time, John Kennedy, didn't do enough to help the Cuban um, freedom fighters there. Cuba, um, South Florida, and Miami remain a bastion of republicanism today. You know, Republican Party very strongly entrenched in South Florida among Cubans, which is very interesting, because of the Bay of Pigs and the assumption that Kennedy didn't do what he was supposed to do. Fourth major wave occurs between May and October of 1980. Castro, again, for reasons we're not really sure, empties his jails, empties his mental hospitals, gets rid of poor people in the streets, and they come to America on the Mariel boat lift. Okay? Thousands of Cubans overwhelming the social services of Miami, of South Florida. And angering Cubans are already there. They don't want these people. Okay? So, so it's not all just homogenous Cuban people in South Florida. And again, the assumptions that they're all murderers. The vast majority of these people turn out to be hardworking, good American citizens. Some of them, just like some of us, turn out to be not so good. But again, changing the shape of South Florida. There they are again. But modern Florida is not just about Cubans. Modern Florida is about Hispanics from all parts of the New World from Central and South America as well. Okay? So Calle Ocho, which is the major road through Little Havana in Cuba, uh, in, in Miami, has become a multi-ethnic place. Colombians, 
Venezuelans. And I've got, I mean, I, you know, I've got all these people in my classes. It's amazing. You know, you're from Cuba? No, I'm from, no, no, I'm from Puerto Rico. No, I'm from Venezuela. No, I'm from Nicaragua. So all of them. Florida, former senator and present senator, both Cuban Americans. Okay. Rubio's fa family comes over here in the 1950s. Martinez comes over here as part of Pedro Pan. The, and both of them, of course, are Republicans, okay? showing the increasingly important power, political power, of these ethnic groups. But significant numbers of Hispanics still toil, as those sugar workers did, in the fields of South Florida, okay? giving us our winter vegetables, giving us our sugar, working for pittance wages in places like Belle Glade, Immokalee, and Clewiston. Places that, that Edward R. Murrow in 1960 calls the harvest of shame, and yet 45 years later, 55 years later, these people still have a, a very tough existence. And Florida's Hispanic population is moving out of South Florida to kind of expand throughout the state. Okay? And I think that's profoundly important. Places that like around the land, around the panhandle that, that had very small Hispanic populations. By the second decade of the 21st century, that, those percentages are increasing dramatically. This is 1908, late in the 1906 census figures. Vast majority of foreign born Floridians from Latin America and Caribbean and Mexico. Okay, not so much from Europe and Asia and Africa. And this tells us the increasing growth of the Puerto Rican community, particularly in central Florida, particularly in, in uh, Volusia County around Deltona and in Osceola County around Kissimmee. You know, I don't know if you can figure out charts, but you know, Hispanic ancestry of, of Cubans going down, Puerto Ricans going somewhat up, eligible voters. Cubans going down, Puerto Ricans going up. Okay, interesting, interesting. Change in Hispanic populations, you can see certainly where we'd expect it. The Gold Coast of Palm Beach, Broward, and Dade counties here, but also the I-4 belt from Tampa all the way across to Daytona through Lakeland, Volusia, and Orange counties. Puerto Ricans in particular, average of 100 Puerto Ricans a week are coming into Central Florida as we speak. 300,000 Puerto Ricans live in Central Florida today. And there we go, you can see. Percentage of Hispanic communities, not so much at all in South Florida. Still Cuban, Cuban Venezuelan, Colombian, but in Central Florida, primarily Puerto Rican, and changing the demographics of the Hispanic vote switching from strictly Republican with Cubans to much more Democratic with Puerto Ricans. Welcome to Florida. Welcome back to La Florida. 21st century, still Spanish after all these years. Viva nuestra raza, anybody know what that means? Long live our race. So, you know, we've come full circle from Spanish contact to Spanish heritage today. So thank you.